tell you what we're going to be uh, talking about today. I'm going to give a little bit of background about Sigma because you hear about Six Sigma, you hear about Lean Six Sigma, you hear about Lean. It's like, what is this stuff? Black belts, green belts, yellow belts, white belts, and all sorts of brown belts in this case. Um, and also, we're going to talk about how can you apply it outside the manufacturing floor? Because I think to a lot of people, they hear about it and think, well, this is strictly something for the shop floor, but it really isn't. There's probably as much or even greater at this point opportunity in the back offices of these companies. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to take you through a case study that will show you a little bit of the tools in use and hopefully, you know, freak you out so much that you don't ask me any tricky questions. <coughs> Okay, you hear about lean, and lean is kind of the left side of this. Um, they both really have their roots back to the turn of the century with Western Electric, and they kind of kept growing simultaneously lean and quality initiatives. So as you can see, a lot of it really came out of the automotive industry as far as lean, as far as looking for ways to get more efficient. Well, the quality piece really came up through Deming's work over in Japan and things like that. A lot of people ask me about ISO 9000 and say, well, would you need this if you're doing that? And the difference between the two is that's really focused much more on quality assurance versus this is focused on improving it. And so we're going to get into that. So, this belt thing, what is it? Okay, one of the questions people always, okay, I need to move, sorry. Excuse me. Is that okay? Oh, come on, Fred, I'm not going to stand in front of this. No, part. just get on the side a bit more so I get you in the picture. Thank you. I deliberately was trying to stay out of the picture, but okay. All right, so anyways, green belts, black belts, yellow belts, all these belt things, what are they? Um, yellow belts, white belts, you'll sometimes hear about that in really big organizations that want to make everybody feel good because if you've been on a project, they call you some kind of a belt. But in general, when you start talking about certification, you're getting to the green belt and then the black belt, and then they roll up the black belts to what's called a master black belt. I think it's Motorola who actually came up with this whole analogy into karate. Don't know why. Um, I can tell you that when I got mine from GE, they did actually hand me a certificate and a really tacky black web belt that I have thrown out, I must admit. Um, green belts are people who have other full-time jobs. So they are somebody who has another set of responsibilities, but they're given a project to run. They do go through about a week of training. They're asked to take an exam. And they do lead a project, but it's usually a simpler project, and the black belt is really overseeing them. Um, so black belts are full-time positions. In most of the really large companies, they make you do it for at least two years. So you have to have it as your full-time job. You have to lead projects that have significant monetary value. Um, so you know you want to be doing things that save anywhere from a half a million on up out of the business. Um, four weeks of training this horrific exam that teach that you go through these grueling questions on tests that you probably will not use 90% of the time. You get down to a core group you use. Um, train and mentor black belts, and then obviously you do have to go before a certification review board showing that you really did know how to use the tools. Lots of the big organizations, including our government, the Army, and, and a lot of projects going on in the military nowadays, for most companies, though, it's the tools can be a little bit overkill. You know, if you get into one of these big companies, yeah, you know, they talk about having a Six Sigma culture. But I think when you're talking to smaller organizations, you're really determining what's the right thing to use. What are the right tools that make sense to help people get more productivity and more quality? So Six Sigma, if we start on that without the lean in it, is really a very customer-centric philosophy. And so a big foundation of it is defining defects. And you start by saying, what would the customer consider a defect? And that's probably one of the key differences because a lot of us, when we look at things, we look at it from our perspective as the business owner or leader, not from the perspective of the customer. And since we're going to talk about transactional things, let me give you an example of something like that. Um, invoices that aren't accurate. From a customer perspective, it's not accurate, for example, if it doesn't have their PO on it. Yet from the business's internal process, they might consider it perfectly accurate. 
you know, you build it for the right amount, for the right parts, the right dates, all those things. But in the customer's mind, it's wrong, it's defective, they're not going to pay it. So that's an example of how something you can look at is, well, this is right, but your customer may look at differently. The whole sigma, it's a Greek word, it means um, standard deviation, and so you're really measuring variation. And so you're saying, if this is what my customer expects, how often do I deliver it within a really tight range? So Six Sigma, what does it really mean? It means 3.4 defects per million opportunities. So it's like you are accurate 99.99966% of the time. What do you mean by million opportunities? So for example, if you, know, you look up at the, the, the left there, how many letters do you deliver? How many airplanes go up and down? So it's a defect if it doesn't you know, meet specifications. So an opportunity, like in that top example, like 300,000 letters being delivered. So when you start getting into what are the defects per million opportunities, then you translate that mathematically and it would tell you that if you're at Six Sigma, you'd have one missed delivery for every 300,000 times you deliver a letter. Now, in the middle there, it talks about what is it for when you're at, I think it says 3.8 Sigma which is where a lot of things fall into is more than that 99% accurate. So you can see then you'd have like 3,000 missed deliveries. And this is where you get into people making a judgment of how much of an investment something is worth. Um, because does it really you know, ruin everything if a letter is misdelivered? Maybe yes, maybe no. But like the airplane landing, that's a pretty big one to all of us. You know, that if an airplane doesn't land correctly, um, you know, I don't want them to be at 3.8 sigma and having two abnormal landings at most airports every day. You know, I like more than one every five so years. So six sigma show. is one for five years and 3.8 is two. Okay, so it's exponential. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing is you can right. see really when you talk about something being 99% accurate and then flipping up to six sigma, it's like 20 times better than three sigma. That said, though, for most organizations, getting to like the three to four sigma range is pretty darn good. And in general, it may be enough, again, because how life critical is your defect? But if it is a life critical defect, like landing an airplane, yeah. that's now, relevant. If, if I understand it, I mean, the, the key when you do your calculations, and I don't want to get on yes. the calculations, but it gets messy. <laughs> it's really the opportunity to make a mistake. So, like, yes. you use the analogy of an invoice. Well, if you've got a complicated invoice and it typically has, 20 different line items and it's got a place for purchase order, a place for a name and address, yep. you could have 10 to 30 or could. 40 opportunities on that one invoice. You're if you get it all right, right. then you got that, that counts 40. Exactly. You're, you're absolutely right because you can have some kinds of transactions where you've got multiple <coughs> opportunities to get it wrong. Right. Um, and then you've got others where it's kind of, it's yes or no, or, you know, it's, it's either right or it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into some of, you know, as Jim and I could talk to, we don't really want to, all the data that you can get into and how complicated this can get. But a, a clear foundation when you do use Sigma is to really get very clear about what is the defect definition and making sure that it's important to the external customer. So the other thing is that because it's very data oriented, and you're going to see in a case study I'm going to take you through, a lot of it's about reducing that variation and reducing the spread of what happens so that people really feel like okay, if you say you're going to do something for me within seven days, I can count on the fact, you know, it may not always be seven, but it's going to be within five to eight days or five to nine days. You know, I can count on that consistency. Because what your customers will feel is those outliers. You know, it's when you take 20 days and 30 days. And if you have too many of those, which I will show you in my case study, a good example of having way too many of those, then people really feel that. So if you were doing a marketing campaign, because I've seen this used in marketing, so many pieces actually get delivered, you know, so many aren't, they might have a bad list. Is that still Six Sigma? I mean, do they try and get it that tight or is that another area? That might be another area. That probably wouldn't be a great example of something you'd apply to it, I don't think. Yeah. Let's, we'll keep going on and see if it makes more sense. Sorry. This is okay, lean, I think a lot of you have heard, you know, especially with the manufacturing area, it's really speed and cost focus. And it's really looking at 
what are you doing that's wasteful? You know, what are the things you do that just really, you know, cause extra time, extra effort, extra material in the process, and how do you get rid of those? And so, what's really interesting is that they, you start getting into this definition of, you know, what's value added, what's like maybe incidental work that's non-value added, but you have to do it in your business, and then what's pure waste. And as you can see, the yellow is the pure waste. So it's almost 50% in most businesses is activity that's really considered wasteful. And these are examples of the eight forms of waste. You know, so you talk about any time you have what we just talked about, the defect, where it's a mistake and you have to rework it. Um, it can be overproduction, making more than what's needed of something at a given time. It can be inventory, stocking output beyond what you need. And that, if you think again, if we talk about the back office, could be you have a closet full of office supplies that you're never going to exhaust. You know, so there's different ways to look at this. Um, motion, when you're doing unnecessary action to complete a task. Um, you may have departments that aren't co-located that really work together. And so people literally get up and walk down the hall many, many times a day. And you're going to see when I go through the case study that even those little things, when you annualize them, can add up to a lot of cost. Um, transportation, moving people or things too far too often, over-processing, doing more that's, that is needed to meet customer specifications. When you get into back office things, a lot of times you'll see people doing things like, let me make a phone call, send an email, and send a letter to the customer. It's like, okay, pick one. You know, we really don't need to do all three, but people start kind of overkilling maybe because one customer complained, and then all of a sudden it becomes part of a process. Waiting, um, this is a big one, waiting for someone or someone else to do something. I mean, we can all picture that more on the manufacturing floor where you've got a line and somebody's standing waiting. But it does happen in transactions, too. Um, a common example is approvals. You know, if you have a manager approving way too much of your business, then you've got people sitting waiting for them to approve it and give it back to them so that they can do what their action is. And you'll see an example of that. And um, human and intellectual waste, you know, not really properly utilizing the skills of employees, because often there really is a lot of knowledge out there and the people know what is wrong in the process, but they aren't always being asked. So those are examples of waste, which as you can see is, you know, pretty big in that pie chart. Incidental work, those are those things that we get into, you know, a lot of companies have put in things to meet what they perceive as the Sarbanes-Oxley requirements, things like that, or it may be things you have to do in order to provide your service. The customer wouldn't say, well, I want to pay for your inspection process, but it's still something you have to do. But value, you can see, very small. Go ahead. So invoicing, technically, that's waste. Yeah, well, it can be, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Technically, the whole invoicing process, yeah, from a customer perspective, they'd be perfectly happy with that one. Exactly. Doesn't add value to that. So really, what you start getting into is questioning what's really happening, how long does it take, challenging every step as to why it's necessary. So this kind of contrasts what is used in the pure Six Sigma methodology, which is this whole define, measure, analyze, improve, control. And it's analyze and improve where you get into all this really heavy duty statistics. But if we build here, when what a lot of companies are doing now is really substituting lean for the analyze and the improve. And so that's where you get into value stream mapping, where you're really looking at what people are doing, looking for where the waste is, and getting the waste out of it. And if you look again at the top, you kind of get this idea of X's being like, okay, let's take out the waste. But you also may have opportunity for Six Sigma because there are places that the customer considers something adding value and just leaning may not really make sure that you're meeting their requirements. So the whole idea of, of doing lean Six Sigma is making sure you have the customer focus and the speed and the efficiency focus. <coughs> So why would you apply this to transactional processes? Well, the first reason is that they represent about 15% of the cost usually. So there's a lot of opportunity there to you know, reduce cost, to improve responsiveness, and furthermore, yes. Um, a lot of companies, especially in manufacturing, they've already realized a lot of the opportunity within 
you know, the, the processes on the manufacturing floor. Um, you know, their customers won't put up with it if something's not at the right quality. They've already, they've got a lot of monitoring equipment and testing, people like Marty coming in and pulling mattresses off and saying, do they meet specifications? So, and you can really see, a lot of times if you're looking out on a shop floor, you can see when something's not going right. It's pretty obvious to the naked eye. But if you go back in the office, it's really hard sometimes to see what's going on. Um, this is a place where email in particular is just like, that can be a whole thing in itself because there's a lot of work that's slipping in through the back door through emails to people that managers don't even have a clue is going on with their folks. And, you know, because of that, it's harder to spot the problems, so that means there's a large opportunity. But also, a lot of times you can make some changes pretty quickly without any kind of a big capital investment. Um, you know, you can change guidelines, you can shift responsibilities, you create a checklist, you look at, you know, Hale and Marty are doing the same thing, and so is John. Does one person have much better results? Which one of you would be in this? Okay, it'd be Hale. You know, so what is Hale doing that the other two aren't? And you look for those opportunities. Um, he raised his hand first. He would be out. He'd be out. So that's why you want to do it. And again, it just it also can give you a competitive edge because sometimes other people are selling the same thing you are. So those irritants you may have in the transactional processes with that like invoicing, as Hale said, you know, a customer may not consider an invoice a value add, but if Serta always gets it right and Sealy always gets it wrong, well, who are you going to do business with? The product may not be that different. So there's a lot of value competition-wise. So. The first thing you ask when you say, where do I go find these things in transaction, is where's the pain? You know, where is it that people are complaining or that I'm not seeing results, things like that. So if we look at the next slide, you know, the first piece is really listen to the process. Is there a place where there's a lot of overtime, where the headcount just feels like it's excessive, where you have internal metrics and they're not being achieved consistently? where you're seeing a lot of errors or rework, big projects, where you walk by and you literally see it's physically a mess, or just you know the layout of something doesn't feel right, it doesn't seem right. The employees usually really know, and as they're grumbling, you know, when you walk by saying things like, I don't know, why, the, why do we do it this way? That's usually a sign that there probably is something that can be worked on. Um, when they talk to you about the vendors impossible to work with, a lot of companies are really seeing that there's benefit in talking cross-functionally if you're really dealing with a vendor a lot, bringing them into a project so that you both benefit from it. And then listen to the customer. You know, if you've got customers complaining, saying, I don't know why this takes so long, why can't you ever get this right? Those are signs that you've got an opportunity to go to these tools. So, I think another really great place to look for this is in what's happening with your receivables file. I spent a lot of years doing collections, and we used to always say that something rolled downhill, if you know what I'm talking about. So, except for cash flow, virtually every other reason that an invoice sits outstanding is because there's some process, either in the order taking, processing, the fulfillment, the distribution, the invoicing, whatever, that's broken. So you want to look for those things, and these actually are pulled out of you know a credit and collection site of what they say are the common reasons, the most common reasons people don't pay. So you can see where processes you might have related to rebates or advertising or promotions, things like that, you know, can go totally astray. Pricing errors, you know, not having a PO, having an incorrect PO, people returning or refusing goods, um, shortages, things like that. So all those things, if you don't have a good process up front, somebody's going to get an invoice and they're going to refuse to pay it. And so often, really talking to whoever handles the collections is a great place to identify where there's problems throughout the whole organization, because it all goes down here. So we're going to talk about an example here, and this is a real company in a real process and this was a situation again and it was popping up within accounts receivable where there were certain types of invoices not being paid and it was pretty clear that a lot of these invoices not being paid the customer had called to dispute it and said something was wrong with it 
and there, were, there was a standard in place saying we should resolve all these things within 10 days. Well, it wasn't happening. And so when that's not happening, then that starts to lag. You've got all these aged invoices and things going on. So you can't get the cash. The customers are getting irritated because it doesn't seem like you can solve a problem to save your life. The salespeople are getting annoyed because they're going in and out of customer locations and hearing about this. So that's kind of when you think at the upper level what management sees as the business case. And that's um, a big piece of this up front is really getting out of management. Where is it? What is the, the big business opportunity in it with a business case? But then the real key, and I think this is where it gets fun, is being able to take this kind of information and take it to the people who are doing the work and frame it up to them about why it's important and get their input on what they see going wrong and really bring it together. Because sometimes they just get used to handling all these problems and they just do it and they don't really understand you know, what's going on. So in this example, literally 25% of the inquiries were resolved within 10 days. 75% um, of them were going beyond 10 days. And there was a median, so half were being resolved before 27 days and half resolved afterwards. Um, so median is the, that measure of the, the half and half versus mean being the average of, you know, it all blended together. This is where you start getting into some of the Sigma stuff about why you look at one versus the other and in data integrity that nobody really wants to hear about, so we won't go there. Um, but this project, at the point we started, we really kept it very simple on the defect because we really just really want to get at this 10-day thing quickly. And so a defect was any time it went beyond 10 days. So it didn't matter, you know, is it open past 10 days? It's defective. And so it made it very easy to measure. And you'll see on the next slide, it was like less than a 1% sigma. So in 60 days, what we were trying to do was get it to a 1.8 sigma, which if you remember, is more like getting it like 63% of the time you're doing it within 10 days. So not exactly stellar, but compared to where we were, it was like cutting the number of defects in half. So it was a big deal. So when you're at this point in the process, you really at a high level just say, what is the process? And this is that 50,000 foot level where you're really talking very high and you start looking for where are the potential problems. You know, where is it we're seeing problems? Is it who's resolving it? Are some people, as we gave the example, doing it faster than other people? Is it the type of issue? We knew right away some of it was going out to sales reps for input, and that was a problem. So not to get too dry with this. Um, but this is where you get into when you're doing a pure sigma. One of the first things you do is you say, do we really have a way to measure this that's right? Somebody told me this line about that even a clock that's dead is right two times a day. So, but in the case of measuring something like this, you want it to be right all the time. So that's one of your first foundational things is to make sure you can measure it and then to check the sigma, which was 0 0.707 in this case. So. This is really more the part that's fun, where you get into process mapping. So what really happened here was we pulled people together in a room, and so I get them together and say, what are you doing when you get an inquiry? What happens? And so you literally start on a flip chart, start marking out what it is. Then you go out to the floor and you watch them do it, because the first thing is usually when people are in a conference room, they'll tell you what they think the process should be, not what they're necessarily doing. And you want to sit and watch because they will, first of all, do different things, sometimes just because they've forgotten they do it. And you'll start to see the things that don't make sense. You start to see that people are walking down the hall over and over and over to the printer. You'll start to see they're printing things that they really have no need to print. In this case, the orange, part of what was going on, this was an activity that had just come in from various sales offices, had been handling it. People didn't have the system access to pull a copy of the contract. I know this sounds like really ludicrous. So they were actually sending emails over to people who processed orders because they had access to contracts, asking them to pull them. And then they'd go up once a day, so they'd take like a 20-minute walk upstairs, and so I'd go say, Hale, do you got my contracts yet? And he'll be like, oh, let me finish printing them. And then we're sitting there chatting and blah, blah, blah. And this is the kind of stuff that really happens all the time. It just becomes a huge time eater. So that's where you start to say, well, gee, can't we get them access in the system to just look at these themselves? 
but they were so avalanched at work, it really wasn't even occurring to anybody. They just knew their standard sign on didn't give them access, so they just do it. You know, nobody's questioning it. Um, they also were sending, because they were worried about relationships with the sales rep, they sent absolutely everything out to them to validate was what they were going to do correct. Well, that added like days into the process because, you know, that's obviously not the salesperson's number one priority. Then the other thing that was going on was when they did have to adjust the invoice, 100% of them had to have the manager look at them. Even if it was like $20, the manager was signing off on it. So it's like, why are we doing this? So right away, you start with this orange being the places where you've got some really wasteful things going on. The yellow are things that are part of the business and they're things that have to happen. But you can see how little of this in green is what the customer values. And those were the things really where you were saying, you call me and tell me what you're going to do about it. If it requires that you adjust it, you do it, you make sure it happens, and you know you close it out. I mean, there's very little that the customer considers of value in here. But when you do this, then you start getting into, okay, let's get out the waste. So these people had almost 600 inquiries, transactions coming in a month. So just doing those simple things of saying, let's change your system access, let's not send everything out to the sales rep, let's only involve them if it's really a high dollar thing. Let's not have your manager improve everything. Took 55 minutes on average out of each transaction. So when you start multiplying that out and annualizing it, it came out to being about four people's work. Now most of this was getting done through overtime, so there wasn't benefits necessarily being paid on it, but people were being paid a time and a half for this. So you guys are really quiet. I'm talking really fast because of my time. Any questions or thoughts? I mean, can you see where this can happen? You're thinking, John. Well, I'm just trying to put it into my own business. Yeah. Because it's transactional. Yeah. 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 Is it? Is what you were doing, was that in-house, or do you, you know, go to analyze this, or do they have specialists that come in, of course? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done it both ways. You know, I was originally certified through GE, so I did it internal there, but then now what I'm doing is I am going into companies. I'm not using all the statistical tools because it's really overkill for most people to, you know, see some of this level of detail. But I am doing a lot of this type of work where you really, you know, say where do you think things are broken? Where is there an opportunity for me to sit down with your employees and see what's going on? Pull them together and say, where do you know there's things that just are wasteful? And a lot of times, really, the best examples come directly from the employees yeah, themselves. Do you, do you get the impression that some of the employees are holding back because they're afraid of their jobs too? Well, you can get into that. You know, you absolutely can get into it. And I think that's where you have to really do this fine balancing act of how you pitch this out. But in most cases, people have plenty of other work they could be doing as well, and they're not getting to it because of some of this. So that's typically more how I'll position it, you know, myself is that it's like, okay, you know, we want to come in here and have you stop doing the things that don't make sense so that you can spend time on the things that do make sense. And people know they're spending time on things that don't make sense. Although sometimes they get into really interesting things. I'm working with somebody right now, very small company. When they go to invoice, their system automatically prints out four copies of each invoice. They only need three. So what they're feeling really proud of is the fact that that fourth invoice, they're saving and they use it as scrap paper. So, you know, they're telling me this, like, look how green we are kind of thing, you know, because we do reuse this and it's kind of like, okay, let's talk to the IT guy the next time he comes in and see if, you know, we can make this print three and then he wouldn't even be touching this and running it through the printer and everything else. And reloading it and jamming the printer and using toner. And using toner and all of that, yeah. I guess the first step is figuring out transactions. Yes. And what and at what point do you want to measure? Do you want to transactions daily, weekly, monthly, annually, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're obviously you're trying to touch the things that people are doing every day. I mean, where you really see the benefit is when you multiply it out and say, sure. like, wow, you know, this really adds up over time. But you know, like if you have somebody who a place where you hear noise, you know, like where your employees are saying, I'm sure I'm sure that never happens to you. Well, the noise I hear is laughter because they're having too much fun. Well, there you go. It's a country club. Well, that's <laughs> more fair, too. That's what I call it. This is a country club. Yeah. But if you pull
full two weeks a day. <laughs> Such a deal. Such a deal. Well, and that's actually a good point, too, because this is where that comes from, is saying that that does build in fatigue factor, vacation time, and all that kind of good stuff. So it's not saying people are working all day. It's saying they work on average about five and a half hours a day. So. A question. Obviously, the more complex whatever process you're going to talk about creates more opportunity. The more right. people involved in the process becomes more inefficiency and then gives yep. you greater opportunity. Uh, do you, you know, yet smaller companies, you know, there's certain things that, that can get done, but do you have sort of in your own mind a minimum size that a company needs to be at where there's a term of number of employees, probably more so more important employees versus exactly. revenue yeah. because the more employees you got more activity. Exactly. That, that there's a size that if you know if someone's got two employees, you know you can help them a little bit, but you can really get a bigger bank for the buck if they've got twenty or thirty employees. I mean do you have a, yeah. a absolutely benchmark? you get more bank for the buck. Although right now I'm actually working with a company that has eight employees and you know part of what's going on is they, they decrease their size as the economy took a downturn. They're starting to see volumes pick back up and it's like do we really need to rehire what we had before or is there a way for us to streamline what we're doing mm -hmm. so even though you have like one person doing each job I'm sh I'm working with that one person seeing what they're doing okay. talking okay. to them about what makes sense sitting down with them and the owner and saying what do you think about this or that and that's actually kind of a fun one because you don't you know they're not going to be able to pull Fred in you know with Manditech or something like that they don't have that kind of money so you have to use your expenses Dollar. But but if you spend the money, but you you'll, might, you'll might save two dollars for every dollar that you spend exactly. with them. Exactly. Oh, so you should have a talk to them. Uh, well, I want them to pay me first. Oh, okay. Percentage should be equal or greater, uh, depending even at a exactly, small level, right. right? I mean, if you get three people and you can eliminate one, my goodness. Oh sure. It's but it's huge. but but what you get, I think what you get is if you got one person, they're doing six different functions. And it's tougher to control what they're doing. If you got it twenty is. people in a group and they're all doing one function. You have far better ways of de developing a more efficient process, which allows you to save time and reduce number of those people. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, just I, I, I just related to my own my own experience, and I just recently hired a part-time person to assist a high a high-paid person who was, in my opinion, overworked. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm paying this other person, you know, nominal amount per hour for part-time work, freeing up this. Yeah. Uh, a high price person to do more and better or and more important sure. I should say oh, more, more important and, and better work and also giving this this person a little better life for herself mm -hmm. you know what I mean because oh, sure. oh, so now is yeah. not totally stressed all the time well and, and, and you want the higher price person that has a higher skill level to spend more of their time doing the high, higher skill stuff. Well, it's all about doing, sure. yeah, doing, doing the, the stuff that's less important and less valuable. Right. Get somebody that's cheaper to do that. So. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so there could be opportunity here because even though somebody's highly skilled, especially if you've been doing something a long time, sometimes you just don't see some of it. That's exactly what happens. You know, sure. you just don't see it. And literally sometimes it is the silly things like where the office equipment is located. I can't tell you how many times moving a printer or something, you know, or a fax machine, where you'll say like, well, why is it that that's not here? And it's like, oh, well, we used to have such and such sitting there. So such and such equipment's been out of there. There's an outlet that would be fine, but nobody's moved it because the habit is just mm -hmm. get up and we walk down the hall. Yeah, we are creatures of habit. I did work with them. <coughs> Some little company called Sprint, and they brought down the company. They're the ones that brought down the company, remember? And what they would do is they they analyzed everything they did and actually flow charted all the steps to see how many things were duplicated or wasteful. Right. As it got more automated by computers, you can go, hey, I can have a computer replace two, three people. But then they got to cite what do they got to put in the computer? And that was part of the process Deming had been working on. Because a lot of people really don't understand the process of going from point A to point B. Right. To right. get something in and something out. Right. And there is a lot. I mean, IT really is a great partner with things like this because a lot of times people are double entering things and stuff like that. But again, that an update to the system can make it so you do it once, not three times in three different places. So there's a lot of opportunity. That's what I was thinking. I, I, okay, I wasn't going to call it out, but didn't Debbie die like 20 years ago yes, or something? No, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry.
Hey, that's okay. They used to work quality. Oh, they're they didn't hear me this time. Everything was quality. I was thinking the sprint around. <laughs> but wasn't it you who was like eating at Deming's grave? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, really, just this is not at the level, you know, of uh, what you might go through, but really this is the key thing, is really getting to this. But even after we did this kind of work, there still was the need for quality. Because as you can see, just moving it to like 1.8 sigma meant there were a lot of customers who were still not very happy where there still was opportunity and where you still really started measuring what are we doing and how consistently are we doing it. So well, look at the, look at the amount that you really, your, your efficiency you increased just by moving it up that little bit. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, that's the thing, it's just huge. So, yeah. yeah. And that's what always surprises people is you go, well, that's no big deal. And then you multiply it out and it's like, oh, wow, well, I guess it is a bigger deal. So on that note, I believe I'm complete unless anybody has any additional